just to review, remember that in our previous talk, we talked about the first law of thermodynamics. And there are two ways of expressing this law. One of them is that whenever there is any kind of process, whatever change in energy happens in our system and whatever change in energy happens in the surroundings, will compensate each other because according to this, the total energy of the universe never changes. In other words, energy is always conserved. It cannot be created and it cannot be destroyed. Now, if we focus exclusively on our system, And that could be, uh, let's say, the burning of a fuel, uh, carrying out a chemical reaction, uh, moving an object across a certain distance, whatever we uh, put the boundaries on to set up our system. There are two ways in which the system can exchange energy with the surroundings. We said they are Q and W, where Q is heat and W is the work. We said that heat is the exchange of thermal energy. And as we explained, what we mean by thermal energy is the collective kinetic energies of all the motions of the particles. When we talk about work, we mean an exchange of energy involved in moving things around. I think in our previous talk, it was left a little vague as to what we really meant by that. So uh, today I hope to give you some examples to make it more specific, okay? So let's go to our uh, screen here and uh, let's work on this uh, PowerPoint. And I hope that you have your uh, notes with you so that you can follow along. Um, when we think about heat, we're really thinking about how does the temperature of a substance change? That's really what we're talking about. And so there are several ways that are, uh, we can do this and several things that are involved. You know, the temperature of an object will change temperature depending on three things. Number one, well, how much energy is actually transferred into the object? Number two, how much material we had? And number three, what type of material are we talking about? And we're gonna introduce a topic here called the specific heat, all right? The specific heat. Uh, when we talk about specific heat, it's a general property called the heat capacity. Specific heat is kind of short for the specific heat capacity. It's a measure of the substance's intrinsic ability to absorb heat. Now, when we define it, we say the specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius. We sometimes abbreviate it as a uh, you know, uppercase C with a subscript S uh, in there. And the units are units of energy per gram per Celsius. Here in this particular table that I'm showing you, the units of energy are joules. But of course, you could have used the units of calories that we mentioned in our previous lecture. So if you look at this uh, table here, it shows you different types of substances, elements, compounds, and other kinds of materials. Uh, let's see how this uh, issue of specific heat works by looking at two very well-known uh, companions, water and sand. Of course, water plus sand equals beach. <laughs> Notice that sand has a specific heat capacity that's roughly about, you know, maybe a fourth or a fifth of the specific heat capacity of water. So I grew up in the tropics, right? And when we used to go to the beach, if you were like the rest of the tourists, 
and you would go kind of late in the morning. You know, the sun has been out for, you know, three, four hours. And you go there and you step out on the sand and kick off your sandals. And of course, your feet burn because the sand is really hot. So you rapidly run towards the, uh, towards the shore, to the beach, to the water. And as soon as that water starts lapping on your feet, you feel that it's cool. And you ask yourself, well, how come if both the water and the sand have been exposed to the same amount of energy from the sun for the same amount of time, why is the water still cool while the sand is uh, hot? Well, it all has to do with basically the difference in the heat capacities or the specific heat of, of these things. All right, uh, let me see if I can find my uh, highlighter here. Here we go. So once more, we were talking, we were, I'm sorry, I kind of faded a little bit there. We were talking about the specific heat capacity. And the point here is that what we're saying is that it takes about five times, four or five times as much heat energy to increase the temperature of water. Water has a greater specific heat capacity. It takes more energy to increase its temperature. So if both water and sand have been exposed to the same amount of solar energy for a number of hours, it is expected that the water because it takes much more energy to increase its temperature, it's still cool, whereas the sand is you know, pretty much still, uh, it's getting really hot. Now, let's change the scenario now. See, growing up, we knew that it was really hot in the day and the sun was very bright. So we would go to the beach, like more like in the late afternoon, early evening, kind of around sunset time. And what you notice at that time was that you would step out on the sand, kick off your sandals, and the sand was kind of cool. And then you would go to the water and the water was still warm. Remember again, just like it takes that much more energy to raise the temperature of water than it does to raise the temperature of sand, in the same way, water keeps that thermal energy a lot longer. In other words, the reverse process, the losing of the heat is also uh, more uh, it's lower for the water because it has a higher specific heat capacity. As I mentioned, uh, we are using here units of uh, energy per gram per Celsius. But in the same fashion, you know, you could have used uh, units of joules per mole per degree Celsius. We would call it in that case the molar heat capacity. Now, what we'd like to do is use this specific uh, heat property to do some calculations. So if we go to the next slide, we find the formula here. I call it the MCAT formula for the simple reason that, you know, visually that's what it looks like. So the heat that is transferred uh, during a process is a result of the product of the mass times the specific heat times the temperature change, all right? So again, mass, times the specific heat, times the temperature. And I call it MCAT because when you look at these letters here, M, C, and then Delta T, it almost looks like it says MCAT. So don't forget, whenever we say Delta anything, it always means final minus initial. That means that all things you know, being equal, mass is a positive amount, Specific heat by definition of the amount of heat required to increase the temperature is positive. So that means that this delta T could be positive or it could be negative, depending on whether the substance uh, ended up at a higher or, or, or a lower temperature than it started. And this component here, delta T, is the one that tells us whether the change in energy, the, the heat, was positive or negative, or as we explained last time whether the process was endothermic, positive Q, or exothermic, negative Q. Now let's consider the following exercise. Okay, I want you to look in your slide in there. If one kilojoule of heat were added to each of the following 50.0 gram substances, which one would increase in temperature by the greatest amount? Okay, let me go back here to our uh, 
paper here. All right. Let's go over here to our paper. Let's look at this slide here. And let's work our way through it. Let me see if I can uh, maybe zoom a little bit into it. Mm, that's a little too much. Mm. I'm going to see if I can zoom a little bit into it here. Oh, there we go. That sounds good. Okay, so remember the formula. The formula is Q equals mass times the specific heat times the temperature change. Notice, in this particular case, each one of the samples weighs 50 grams. In other words, this mass factor here is the same for all of them. What else is the same? Well, it says here that we are going to add, I'm sorry, we are going to add one kilojoule of energy to each one. So that means that the heat in this equation is the same for all three. So that means that the two variables we have are the specific heat and the term temperature change. Now remember, if I have an equation, if I make any change on one side, I have to compensate with a change on the other side. In this case, I am changing the value of the specific heat, right? So if this is going to remain as an equation, if this increases, right? If this becomes larger, in order for this equation to remain, that means this must decrease. Therefore, whoever has the larger value of the specific heat will experience the smaller change in temperature. Whoever has the smaller value of the specific heat will have to increase the, I'm sorry, will have to experience the larger increase in temperature. Therefore, since we have here aluminum at 0.895 joules per gram per Celsius, copper at 0.377, and lead at 0.129, what that means is that as you go up this scale here, right, For the same mass and with the same amount of heat applied, then that means that uh, you have to go in this direction with delta T. In other words, the substance that has the smallest specific heat should experience the largest temperature change. In other words, it takes less heat to increase the temperature of lead by a certain amount of degrees versus copper or aluminum, okay? All right, let's come back to our screen here. And let's consider now another aspect of these changes that we've been talking about and probably have not explained very well, all right? So let me summarize what we just said here. We said that in this case, the greatest temperature change would be for the metal with the smallest value of the specific heat, which in this case we said was lead. Okay, let me give you a few seconds to think about that and work your way through that equation, all right? And now let's talk about the other actor in this uh, stage of uh, thermochemistry, of energy changes, and that is work. We haven't talked much about work. So whereas I think we understand heat because we can see how 
for example, if the particles of, of a substance have a lot of kinetic energy, as they bounce against each other, and as they bounce against the walls of the container, they'll be transferring some of that kinetic energy to the, uh, let's say the air or other molecules around. And I think we can see how uh, heat can be transferred. Work is not something that's very obvious to us, especially when we're talking about a chemical reaction. So essentially what we're gonna learn is that when we uh, observe work done by a system in chemistry, it typically involves either expansion, right? Or compression of a gas. And as we're gonna see in a few moments, work is measured by this uh, PV product. This is the uh, PV work. So PV, pressure times volume, as we're gonna see, is actually a unit of energy. And the way we look at it is, when a gas expands against an external uh, pressure, we would say it goes from a smaller to a larger volume. And so delta V is positive, all right? Now, because this represents my system performing work against the surroundings, it's as if I am transferring energy to the surroundings by kind of moving them out of the way. And therefore, because of that, according to our previous discussion, we would say that the work performed in this case is negative, all right? That is how it works. Now, what I want us to do is, I want us to look at some uh, ideas here, and we're probably gonna work this out uh, little by little here. So let's consider the definition of work, which is the action of a force in moving an object over a certain distance. Okay, we're gonna say that is what uh, work is. Now, consider this. What would be the units uh, if we follow this, all right? Okay, so basically we would say, if I were to take the pressure times volume product, I would be using for pressure, it would be units of force per area, Correct, you can see it there. And the volume would be the, uh, usually calculated as the, uh, you know, the width times the height times the depth. In other words, the cube of the units of measurement. And so because of that, what will happen is, right? Some of these things are gonna cancel out. So this cancels out with that. And we end up with a, force times distance, which is essentially work. In other words, the product of pressure against volume, which we saw in the ideal gas equation, actually results in units of energy. And to keep it simple, let me tell you what the conversion is. One liter atmosphere is equivalent to 101.3 joules, all right? Now remember, if we are expanding a gas, we know delta V is positive, right? Now, uh, if I multiply that times the uh, constant pressure in the negative, right? That will be turning it into negative. And remember, this is what work is. In other words, what we're saying is that for work done by the system, we've always said that the uh, work has a negative sign. So in this kind of scenario, what we're saying essentially is that when a system expands against the surroundings at constant pressure, the work performed by the system is minus P delta V. And if we have the units of liters and atmospheres, we can use that conversion there on the top to change between liters, atmospheres, and joules. Now, don't forget, work is not a state function. In other words, work is an exchange of energy. In other words, it's energy exchange in a process. It is not a difference between some kind of final minus some kind of initial state because work is a function that depends on the path of the process, not on the uh, final 
minus the initial state, right? So let's go ahead and try out this example. Let's say a sample of nitrogen gas expands in volume from 1.6 liters to 5.4 liters at constant temperature. Let's do two scenarios here. One is, what is the work done in joules? Okay, don't forget that it's asking us for the work in joules. If the gas expands A against a vacuum and B against a constant pressure of 3.7 atmospheres. All right, let's start out with case A. Remember, delta V will be the change in volume, final minus initial, and work will be minus P delta V, but don't forget we had to convert liters atmospheres into joules. All right, so first case, delta V is final minus initial, 5.4 minus 1.6 liters. That's a net change of 3.8 liters. It's positive because the gas expanded, right? However, in this case, it says that it's expanding against a vacuum. In other words, there is no pressure. Remember, pressure is generated by collisions of particles against the container. Well, uh, a vacuum means there are no particles. Therefore, in this scenario, the pressure is actually zero. So if I calculate the work, believe it or not, even though I have an expansion of a gas minus zero atmospheres times 3.8 liters is actually zero liters per atmospheres and zero joules of work have been performed kind of hard to wrap our heads around that because we think, well, but we the piston moved. See, but the thing is, remember, work is, what did my system do to the surroundings? There are really no surroundings to speak of here because there's no air around, there's no molecules to move. And therefore, my gas expanded, but it didn't transfer energy in the form of work to anything outside of the system, okay? Let's look at the next case. Again, in the second case, delta V is still the same because remember, volume is a property or a function of state, and therefore the change in volume only depends on what's the final and what's the initial state, 3.8 liters. In this scenario though, the pressure that is being applied is 3.7 atmospheres, all right? So that is a different scenario. Remember we said work depends on the path not on the final minus initial states. So what we're gonna say is that work will be minus 3.7 atmospheres times delta V, which is 3.8 liters. And that gives me negative 14.1 liters atmospheres. Now we had to convert that to joules because that's what the question asked for. So the conversion is that one liter atmosphere equals 101.3 joules. So just like we've been doing from, you know, the first week of the semester, we're going to turn that equivalent statement into a conversion factor with the units that we want to remove in the bottom. So our result in liters atmospheres times 101.3 joules for every liter atmosphere. So the liters atmospheres are going to cancel out, put the numbers in the calculator. We have essentially three sig figs here uh, in our input value, right? Right there. So my final result has to be rounded to three sig figs, and that gives us negative 1,430 joules. So what do you notice here? Again, because my gas was expanding, because my system pushed molecules of air in the surroundings kind of out of the way against a pressure of 3.7 atmospheres, my system essentially performed 1,000 430 joules of work. And because that is as if energy is being transferred from the system to the surroundings, it has a negative sign, okay? So that is an example of how we see work. Now, our next task is going to be, how can we set ourselves up so that we can measure these things in actual chemical reactions? For example, what happens with a chemical reaction where there's no gas being produced, where there's no expansion or compression of gas, right? Many reactions in chemical solution, in uh, aqueous solutions, I'm sorry, 
uh, do not involve any kind of expansion or contraction of gases. So uh, we're going to deal with that in our next lecture. However, uh, while we get there, okay, so what you're going to be doing is you're going to be going to this website, all right? And what it is, it's an exercise. It's an interactive exercise. There's going to be some narration. There's going to be some graphics. And as you move through it, what will happen is uh, you'll advance section by section. And in each section, you may have a little activity that you're going to be doing. And then uh, after each section is done, this little arrow here will start kind of like blinking like that. And that means you can click it and go to the next section. All right. So it's going to walk you again through some of the stuff that we discussed in the previous uh, lecture and some of the stuff that we discussed today and give you a chance to do some practice exercises where you calculate heat and work and play with the different signs that these things have and their impact on the internal energy of our system. Okay, I'm going to put this link in your uh, Canvas site and you'll be able to go for it. And, I mean, go to it, I'm sorry and you'll be able to practice that, okay? So it's very important that uh, once you finish this uh, video, you do that practice exercise on that website, and that way you'll be ready for our lecture this coming Monday, where we're gonna talk about the topic of calorimetry. In other words, what are the methods that we use to measure the transactions of energy that happen in chemical reactions, okay? Thanks for uh, being here, and I will see you on Monday.